preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's an honor to be among you. Gloria Steinem, saint, goddess, icon, she doesn't like that one, missionary, inspiration, orator, activist, feminist, legend. All words apply. She's been a public figure and touched our lives and hearts for a quarter of a century. Her biographer, Carolyn Heilbrunn, in the recent The Education of a Woman, the Life of Gloria Steinem, renders her as a paradoxical image, both glamorous and radical. Steinem herself has written that the word radical means to get to the root of things. She succeeds then in being both the cat's pajama tops and bottoms. She is American history in her own time, having touched aspects as far ranging as Cesar Chavez, the Playboy Bunny Club, the Civil Rights Movement, and Mike Nichols. She has a way with words. We all remember her remark on turning 40, this is what 40 looks like. It was repeated at 50, this is what 50 looks like. Demonstrating for the Catholic Church to support abortion rights and the ordination of women as priests on the occasion of the Pope's recent visit to New York, she said, we're not against the Pope. The Pope is against us. We will live to see the day that St. Patrick's Cathedral is a childcare center and the Pope is no longer a disgrace to the skirt he has on. Her book, Outrageous Acts and Everyday Rebellions, originally published in 1983, has been re-released. In her essay, Doing 60, she comes to the end by saying that she was going to end with the words, there's no second like the next one. Instead, she ended with, there's no second like this one. With that in mind, would you please welcome Gloria Steinem. What an introduction. I mean, it's gonna, I always knew I wanted to live to 100, but it's gonna take me to 100 to live up to your. Now, <laughs> now. Your humility has also been um, well recorded. <laughs> and your grace. So, um, Outrageous Acts and Everyday Rebellions is in the bookstores now. And you said you wrote a new, there's new notes, a new beginning. Yes, I, I wrote another preface for it. It came out first 12 years ago and um, surprisingly stayed in print. Uh, my publisher had made very clear to me that the average life of a hardcover book is something between milk and eggs. So <laughs> we were all surprised. <laughs> but since it's still around, I thought it needed some updating. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm hoping that tonight we can talk a little bit about updating in general. We're in a, a difficult time, an interesting time. Uh, things are moving. You said that uh, a movement is only composed of people moving. You think we're moving? I do think we're moving, but it's as if there's a dissonance somehow. I mean, people are moving at the, the bottom 80% but that some of the top 20% is moving the other way. So there's this terrific friction as we go like this, and it's quite frightening, I think. The public opinion polls on issues are quite good, but because, I mean in part because uh, only half of us are registered to vote, and only 39%, I think, of those who are registered to vote actually vote, this very small percentage has disproportionate influence. And since the ultra-right wing 
votes like 90% of its membership, then they end up, you know, going the other way and dragging the 80% with them. But I remember seeing you right after the um, Republican Congress victory. And um, a lot of people were kind of down in the dumps. And uh, I remember very clearly that you were the first person who had an idea of, of what to do, you know, because sort of when I saw you after that, you, you just immediately were talking about getting people to vote. How's that going? Uh, well, you have to watch me because uh, uh, optimism is like an <laughs> occupational hazard of organizers, you know? <laughs> so, uh, I strive not for cynicism, which I think is a mistake, but for healthy skepticism is my goal. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, it really depends what each of us in this audience does and what organizations do. I think there's alarm. I think there's an understanding now that everything that we, if I may say so loosely, we care about, I mean, environmental issues, affirmative action, all the measures of equality, social programs, are all hanging by the thread of the White House. On the other hand, just a couple of hundred votes per precinct would make the difference. I do think there's more realization of that. But I still come upon lots of women's centers and other, pro, you know, lots of good programs that don't ask people routinely when they come in, are you registered to vote? Where do you live? Do you want to know how the services you're getting connect to the election? Uh, would you like us to sit with your kids while you vote? Uh, you know, all of these things that should be routine. The right-wing groups are clearly doing that in a very sophisticated, computerized way, and we're just beginning. But on the other hand, there are a lot, of more, there are a lot more of us, so the answer is blowing in the wind, I suspect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of um, fracturing and fragmentation going on right now. Um, I uh, did not see, but uh, pulled up a... Uh, a transcript of a Charlie Rose show that you did recently with Patricia Williams, the uh, law scholar at Columbia. And you expressed um, your reaction to the OJ trial on your way to Milwaukee as a, a feeling of having tears behind your eyes. And that, um, that really stayed with me and it reminded me of an image in um, uh, in Miss Heilbrunn's biography, uh, in which she gives an account of a dinner party that you went to um, at the home of the chairman of the board of New York Magazine. And there was an anthropologist there who was saying uh, that women couldn't be effective in politics because they couldn't bond. And Gail Sheehy, the journalist, was agreeing with some of the things that he was saying. And you said that you had the feeling of uh, tears at the back of your throat and I wonder um, about those background tears and if you've thought about what they meant on this particular occasion of the OJ verdict, the tears in the back of your eyes. Well, uh, certainly to me, I mean, <laughs> what brought those tears was thinking of uh, Nicole putting these bits of evidence in a safety deposit box, calling a battered women's shelter five days before her death, saying that she feared that her ex-husband was going to kill her, writing all these things in her diary, um, none of which the jury knew. So, you know, the jury really only was told about the 1987 incident, so I don't mean to say that I am blaming the jury, nor do I think that the um, experiences with the LAPD um, should be forgotten. In fact, one of my frustrations was that the, uh, though the, the racial bias within the LAPD was being talked about, other things were not. For instance, I remember that Maxine Waters, the Congress, Congresswoman from California when she was still, I think, in the state legislature, had to get uh, a piece of legislation passed to keep the LAPD from strip searching women who had been stopped for speeding. Mm -hmm. 
No, so, and I, I'm not trying to indict the whole LAPD either because I have found in my life that you know, the best and the worst folks are police officers, and some of the police officers are a lot better than the intellectuals with a lot more money who are criticizing them, you know. Um, but it just, it, it just seemed so unfair totally. But what, what rescued me, it's interesting you, you talk about those two times, because the first time was much harder than the second. That was many years apart. And the, the sitting there and listening to that anthropologist, who was Lionel Tiger, I'd you know, never let a chance to name the bad guy go. <laughs> I was trying to hide that, but. Um, the, the, the difference between um, that time and years later now is that now I have an outlet for my rage and anger because I can go out and talk to people and listen to people and, you, you know, it's, it's, it becomes like an energy cell. I think anger is only a problem when you keep it inward and it turns to, to bitterness and depression. Um, but as I've been, because I've been on a little book tour, so I've been in about, I don't know, seven or eight cities since then, and I notice amazing things. People are actually using this as an occasion to talk to each other, mm -hmm. you know, to tell what their experiences with police have been and why they didn't trust the police evidence and what their experiences with violence in their own families or their neighbors have been. Uh, and, and if we can do that, you know, we, we can turn this mythic horrendous event, which because it's unresolved, is going to be this blank screen on which we project our own worst fears in any case, we can turn it into something that's positive. Now, for me, you are uh, a rare individual because you managed um, to combine uh, the women's movement with the consciousness of civil rights. So I would say that this new quest, seemingly new quest of finding ways to talk about race and gender at the same time is something that's certainly not foreign to you. How are you working with the complexity of the O.J. Simpson uh, myth in terms of race and mm -hmm. gender? Well, I'm listening. I mean, you know, audiences, as I'm sure we'll see in a few minutes, are incredibly smart. And um, I think that combined with, with trying to, to use the case to look at the to shed light on unpublicized cases um, has, has made me see, uh, or helped me see the connections. Um, for instance, I would say that what um, African American women, and as we now say, European American women, uh, share is a desire, is, is, the, is the socialization to support our men. So when we look at this case, we have to remember cases w in which there were white women on the jury and white defendants. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, there was a case in South Carolina that the opinion came down just at the time of the Rodney King verdict. And it was a case in which a woman, a white woman, had been tied to the bed uh, adhesive tape over her mouth, handcuffs, tortured for hours, her breasts cut with knives. Uh, the husband, also white, had um, videotaped the whole thing, and she escaped and brought charges, and the videotape was shown to the jury, and the jury, which included eight women, mm -hmm. I think they were all white, exonerated him, and said that obviously she must have just been into rough sex, and he uh, needed help. Now, you know, I, I think that, that, there are desires, that there are desires in us in various ways to protect our men, on the one hand, and to dissociate from the victim, on the other, because we don't want to admit that this victim could be us. It's too painful. So if we can say that she did something that brought this on, it's, it's much more comfortable. And, you know, that's, um, that's something we, you know, that, we both have to work on, we all have to work on amid, you know, all the other complexities and so on. I mean, I would say that until folks 
uh, black and white, are out in the street about the Rodney King videotape. And until uh, women and men, black and white, are out in the street about this other videotape verdict. Right. You know, that we aren't where we need to be. Right. One of the things that disturbed me, we were trying to remember backstage when we, when I first ever had approached you for an interview, and I, I recall it as being after Anita Hill in a church downtown in New York. Um, and that, I always think of that year as beginning around then, you know, uh, uh, with Anita Hill and the events that came after, um, and ending sort of with uh, the Los Angeles uh, riots. But what disturbed me was, because that, that church was full of people, as I remember coming up to uh, say things about sexual harassment, is that when it came time to look at the beating of Rodney King, I saw a real silence from white women. And I wonder about that, mm -hmm. or about right now with affirmative action, which as we watch it in the hospital, um, you know, whatever happens is gonna affect women too. But most of the discussion is centered around race. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, believe me, I'm not here to defend all white women. I oh, I don't, I don't mean, and I don't mean to put you on <laughs> no, the no, defensive. You understand. But, there, but the, the, the Rodney King verdict, I mean, I was, I was in Los Angeles the, the day that it came, came over the radio, you know, when I was going around to benefits. Um, and they were feminist benefits. And it was, you know, the subject of outrage at those benefits. And I think that, the, that now and other organizations did... Uh, organized demonstrations now, you know, perhaps not as much as they should have. Or maybe it's did. that we, it's again this problem of what we see and what we don't well, see. Well, I think, I, yeah, the, the problem, I think that's a big problem with affirmative action because I, I notice that it is phrased almost always in the way that I guess is supposed to make it the least popular because it involves the least people and that is, that has to do with race. And um, um, a lot of, you know, all of the, the women's organizations that I'm, you know, involved with or aware of support affirmative action. Obviously, benefits white women, women of color, men of color. That's the whole point. I have tried to petition some of the um, media folks I know, you know, to and given them lists of people, of white women to to um, talk to, you know, and it's it's really not very successful. So I, I think that that's more true with affirmative action, though I have a sense with Rodney King there weren't enough white people out in the street, probably. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one of the things I wonder about with these issues is that uh, what, and you would, you, would, you would know this, I would want to be asking you this whether we're in front of people or not. What are the different ways that all of us can occupy public space about these issues. When I, once talking to Lonnie Guineer, she pointed out to me that the problem with looking at the Rodney King event was that we were looking at it through the window of the justice system. This is similar with OJ, right? And that many of us were using it as an opportunity to talk about many, many social problems. But by squeezing them all into that window of the justice system, we were distorting them because that window's not large enough to encompass these issues. Likewise mm -hmm. with OJ. Every talk show is about where we are in race in America as a result of this verdict. And then we put on top of that the window of the media. So I wonder if you could give us some ideas of other places that we can explore these issues. Well, I, I think that as in was the case with Anita Hill, what made it... Um, I mean, there was one feeling in the country at the end of those hearings, and there was a different feeling a few months later. And that was because people had used it as an occasion to come forward and tell their own stories. So I, I think the way to get it out of this narrow little tiny window is to stop individualizing things and tell our own stories so we can see the shared themes of those stories and we can get at group solutions. I think the, the most sinister thing that the media does is to individualize everything. Mm. 
you, you know, it, it, which keeps us from, from making, from being able to see group solutions. I was thinking, I think about this in terms of the accused, you know, the, there was a film that was made uh, about the um, Bedford rape case, more or less, you know, which a woman uh, was uh, raped on a pool table. Do you remember this case? And yeah. then, um, do you all remember this? Case? Yeah, and, and it, uh, it, it was the model for this, this film um, with Jodie Foster oh. uh, in, in which what was revolutionary, uh, you know, as a result of this case was that someone from the DA's office came forward and prosecuted the bystanders so that the principle that bystanders were also guilty if they hmm. didn't intervene, you know, was established. Now, this script was sent to me, actually, uh, before it was done, and it was this case of this one woman, and I said, but that isn't the way, that is the way it happened. You know, there's a rape case like this in every town in America every week. The only reason that this was different was because there was a women's center in Bedford, and the women's center of long standing had white women, black women, and Portuguese women as, uh, you know, part of it. Now, it was important, especially there were Portuguese women because the accused rapists were Portuguese and they were saying that this was racist. Those women together marched through the main streets of Bedford every night, I think for a month, carrying lighted candles before this case got any attention. And if you don't know that, you're gonna sit there and wait for somebody from the DA's office to come and rescue you. Hmm. you know? And hmm. that isn't what happens. Hmm. So, you know, I, I think the, what we can do is say to each other, not um, have a symbolic argument about this little window of the OJ case, and say, ferociously, I'm on one side and ferociously, I'm on the other, but we can say why. Because the why are our own experiences. Right. The, the why is, is what happened um, that I know about uh, with domestic violence, or what happened that I know about with, with the police and so on, or what happened, you know, wh whatever. If we do that and, and understand there's no individual solution, there's only shared solutions, Mm -hmm. then I think we can get out of this tiny little window. Mm -hmm. What would be some of the forums where that could take place? Well, um, it takes place in offices, I notice. I mean, I, I was the first place I went um, was, in the, was in Minneapolis, I think, or one of the first places after the OJ verdict. And I went to the PBS station there, which is a very large one. Um, and, of course, talk fell to the OJ verdict. And they said that in, of their couple of hundred people who worked there, people were feeling very racially divided because of different responses to the verdict. So they actually, uh, this may be an especially enlightened group, it's PBS after all, I don't know, but anyway, they, <laughs> they, they actually um, made, you know, called special meetings about it. And people got up and said why they felt the way they felt. And by, you know, three or four hours later, they understood each, better, each other better than they had before. Mm. So it can happen almost anywhere. It can happen in school, it can happen in our neighborhoods, you know, but we have to make it happen. We have to not just, as I did the first time, let the tears in my throat it stay there so as a lump, <laughs> um, but rather to, to take that and see what we can do with it. I think that working with that idea of the tears at the back of your throat and the tears at the back of your eyes, the one benefit I think about having that situation is that it allows you to have both vision and um, tears at the same time. In other words, the tears don't clutter your vision. And it also allows You're you... You're a poet. I didn't think right? of it that way. And also that <laughs> allows you, it allows you to speak. If it had been that the tears had kept you from speaking, put a lump in your throat, mm -hmm. we'd be in a different situation, which is what makes you the remarkable well, I, individual. Well, I think this is, it's, it's a problem for, for, for me, and I think a lot of women, that when we get angry, we cry. Does any, that happen to anybody else? <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and so, because we don't want to cry, uh, because it makes us feel vulnerable and stupid and silly and so on, then we suppress our anger. And this has always been a problem for me, but I, I met a woman in one of these smart, you know, audiences or something who told me a great thing. She said that she's an executive and she has to use her anger, you know, in a, in a constructive way. So, but she cries. So now she gets angry with her colleagues and she cries and she talks through it. She says, 
you may think that I am sad because I'm crying, but I'm not. Uh, this is the way I get angry, and she just keeps going. Oh, great, <laughs> great. That's great. That's great. You know, you, um, what is it that you said that it, it's not uh, so much the domestic violence is the wrong word, it's personal terrorism? It's personal terrorism, but since then, I'm still, maybe we can talk about it later, I'm yeah. still in search of a word, because, because domestic makes it sound trivialized, and uh, personal terrorism is the way it feels, but it also doesn't say it's outcome, so now I'm inclined to call it original violence, because violence in the family is where all other violence comes from. I mean, you have only to go to prisons and talk to people there, or you have only to, you know, look at world leaders who are, think violence is the only solution to a problem. You know, it's, it starts, it's its origin in the family. These words are really important, of course. You know, who owns these words? Something that um, gave me pleasure, uh, many things gave me pleasure while I was getting ready to talk to you tonight. One of them was um, uh, an interview that you did with Jim Brown, uh, who I also had the occasion to interview at one point. And, uh, or rather, a story that you did about Jim Brown. And what fascinated me about it in particular was the way that you switched between black and Negro in a time when uh, people were trying to, like, fighting about which was the right word. And I wondered if that was conscious on your part, because it seems to be a good solution. Uh, yeah, I think it was conscious because I was trying to mm, pay attention to the way people talked. And, and also, I, you know, I mean, I, I was in some kind of middle place. This, this must have been in, when, the late 60s or yeah, something? Yeah, 68, I think. Yeah. No, it was really a long time ago. And um, also, um, it, he reminded me of all the guys I went to high school with, so it took me back even further. He was exactly like all the guys I went to high school with in, in Waite High School in Toledo, Ohio. Because he was a football player? Or? Yeah, because he was a football player. He had this whole attitude toward life, you know, that was so, so similar. And I mean, I'd gone to a, a high school in which the only rule was you had to stop playing ball when you were 22. So they had, re <laughs> they had really great players. But also, <laughs> also I, was very, um, <laughs> I was very touched by him in, in, a, in the following way. Um, of course, it's true that just after I published this story, he was reported as having thrown a woman off a balcony, uh, you know. Actually, that's, it's in the story, that, that Is account. it in the story? Yeah. It must have happened. I must that have sneaked it in. he beat her and, and, uh, and threw her out the window. Yeah, so, you know, this tends to, you know, make you think twice about what you're writing. But, um, but he, um, he always talked about getting up slow, uh, that is, you know, when he was hurt on the football field, whether or not he was hurt, he got up slow so they wouldn't know when he was hurt. And I always thought it was such a metaphor for the problems of the masculine role and how, how boys get raised, you know, that they can't say when they're hurt. Yeah, yeah. The other thing interesting in that article as a kind of a, um, I don't know, it has resonance now is that thinking back again about OJ, the verdict day, one of the things that disturbed and perplexed a lot of people was that African Americans cheered. And in that article, you describe a movie that Jim Brown is in, uh, which was a sequel to a Lee Marvin movie, in which he hits a white man several times. And you wrote, at that time, in 1968, imagine the applause and cheering that there will be in Harlem when that movie is shown. Well, he had a bad guy, though. He had a bad, but he had a, a white bad guy. Yes, right. Yeah. And I, one of the things I wondered about with, with, with this event we've just been through is the element of surprise, like that particular surprise, the number of people who were surprised by that joy, and certainly many of us were very disturbed by it. Well, it was um, enormously disturbing, um, but it's disturbing also, I mean, the number of white guys, guilty white guys who have got off because of reasonable doubt is incredible. 
And if you start enumerating them and the number of people who cheered them, you know, uh, you begin to feel slightly different about it. But then you have to add the very important element of the rareness of it. You know, that anybody black beats the system. Right. And, and I think that's one of the dangers of this trial, that it will cause people to think that defendants of color in general are treated better than they really are. I mean, he in no way represents what, what happens in, this, in the system to, to most people. And, you know, there's the, the, the backlash of that, I think, is worrisome. So it's, it seems terribly important that we keep following the strands of, this, of that mythic story to other realities. Um, in, in fact, I, I am hoping that some of these shows that have been on simply because of OJ will stay on and talk now about other cases that don't get publicity. For instance, I notice wandering around the country that people are very concerned, women are very concerned, white and black women are very concerned about the kids. Are the kids, is he gonna get custody of the kids? Setting aside the question of whether he you know, committed the murders or not, which we're probably never gonna know, the, uh, he was violent towards their mother in many situations of which the children were well aware. Now, if we take that concern and look at other situations, we'll learn a lot. There were two cases, one recently, one in Illinois and one here in New York State, in which the father was convicted of killing the mother of his children and still got custody because the judge said that it didn't matter, you know. Right. I mean, you know, it com the combination of the idea that children are owned by their biological parent plus uh, the, the whole bias of the courts in general, it isn't the laws at this moment, it's more the judges, I think. But, you know, we, we need to, to look at that. If we follow those strands, we can learn an enormous amount. But we can't forget. But we can't forget. No, yeah. we've, we've, got to, we've, we've got to use this. If we suppress it, if we say, oh, we can't talk about it because it will create racial tension in the office, or we can't talk about it because um, it will make me remember that I was battered. Right. You know, I mean, th think about Hedda Nussbaum. Women didn't identify with Hedda Nussbaum to the degree that I would personally would have hoped either because it was easier to blame her than mm -hmm. it was to admit that we could be her. Mm -hmm. One of the um, incidents you cite as, uh, I guess, your politicization, although it seems to me you're pretty political all along, is um, covering a, um, an abortion hearing um, in... Uh, here in New York, for New York Magazine, I think it was. And um, so, and we all know, even from your way with words with regard to the Pope, that um, uh, this has been an issue uh, which is very important to you. Um, I'm wondering how you're thinking about the complexity of uh, feminists right now. Uh, Naomi, Naomi Wolf has an article on abortion in this week's New Republic. And she seems to be calling for uh, a looking at abortion which gives room for sin and redemption. Uh, I just want to quote something from it. Uh, she says, um, imagine a democracy in which women would be valued so highly in which there is no coerced sex without serious jail time, in which there are affordable, safe contraceptives available, in which, in such a world in which the idea of gender as a barrier has become a dusty artifact, in that world, passionate feminists might well hold candlelight vigils at abortion clinics standing shoulder to shoulder with the doctors who work there, commemorating and saying goodbye to the dead, meaning the dead fetuses. Mm -hmm. work, work with that a little bit, the idea. <laughs> well, I think Naomi uh, is a friend and an honest person, you know, and I think that she is uh, talking about the fact that in her experience, 
the um, pro-choice movement hasn't talked enough about, you know, it's gotten embattled, and so it hasn't talked enough about the um, sorrow or the momentous decision that this is. I mean, I haven't read the whole article, yeah. but people have been telling me quotes from it. Um, and I trust that that's her experience. My experience is different. My experience is that we present abortion as almost nothing but an agonized decision. And when I see it presented on television, it is um, clearly as a way to indicate character. You know, if somebody tries to get somebody else to have an abortion, it means that they're a bad person. Or if somebody has an abortion or thinks about it, they sort of read I mean, it's very agonized. Now, what I haven't seen reflected in the, in the abortion rhetoric very much is my experience. My experience was very different. I was 22 years old, and abortion was illegal in this country. It was semi-legal in England where I was. Um, I went through, you know, everything that, you know, you can imagine you know, trying to, to find an abortion. The, this was before there was a feminist movement, so I spent a lot of years trying to make myself feel guilty trying to make myself feel like I wanted to light a candle and, you know, yeah, go through this kind of uh, feeling of sin and redemption and so on. And I couldn't, no matter how I tried to make myself feel guilty, I couldn't do it. It was the first time in my life that I had taken responsibility for my own life. And I don't see that reflected very much in the rhetoric either. I live across the street from a clinic where abortions uh, were done. I think not anymore, but they were done. And I used to see women pulling up there in old battered cars and you know, coming out and going to the local liquor store and getting little bottles of champagne. You know, the, the, the truth is that it's every, it's, it, it's every experience depending on what we come to it with, you know, to what we invest it with. And, and, I, and I agree that we should cherish them all and allow for them all and honor them all. Um, but I don't agree that, in my experience, I'm only speaking for myself, that the pro-choice movement has presented it as less serious as a decision than it really is. I mean, it's, it's the pro-choice movement that has provided women with counselors to go through the process with them and you know all of the um, sensitivity that is now you know, imitated in other, in other procedures. And yet there is some resonance again, her idea of uh, redemption, of um, looking for atonement, she uses that word, only if we uphold abortion rights within a matrix of individual conscience, atonement, and responsibility, right? It, it you know, kind of blends in with also, the beginning of last week, which I spent with Susan Faludi at the Million Man March, right? This idea of atonement. I don't think that Naomi Wolf's idea of retrieving uh, some kind of moral high ground is, is um, exclusive. I think something's going on. I wonder if you're experiencing that. Well, I don't feel like we need to retain the moral high ground. I mean, I think, you know, it, we're talking about protecting people's choice and individuality and complexity. That's what choice means, you know. So it seems to me, in and of itself, mm -hmm. more respectful of other people to protect their choice. I mean, we would go, and the women's movement certainly has gone to the same length to protect women from having from being coerced into an abortion. Or, uh, I mean, that's what all the protests in China were about, you know, because mm -hmm. women there are coerced into abortion. Um, and the, the first effort of the reproductive freedom movement, you know, was to um, keep women, it, it, most of these cases were in California, as it happened, uh, women from being sterilized without their knowledge or without their proper consent. So, you know, it, the abortion became the focal point of the movement, not because it was, but because the right wing focused on it, you know, as uh, their, you know, they made it the, the, the focal point. Um, 
but um, I suppose all of this is contained, actually, talking about populist wisdom, in the first comment, or anyway, the first most memorable comment I ever heard, which came from an old Irish woman taxi driver in Boston who uh, was listening to Flo Kennedy, because we were lecturing together, so she was, and Flo Kennedy had just written a book called Abortion Rap. Hmm. So Flo and I were sitting in the back seat of her taxi discussing her book, and this old woman turned around to us and said, you know, if men could get pregnant, abortion would be a sacrament. Right. <laughs> so, right. so maybe we need a sac- we need more ceremonies. You know, huh. we need we need ceremonies for divorce as well as for marriage, and we need ceremonies that honor all the different occasions in our lives. We probably do need a ceremony for abortion, but but we um, how shall I say? I sense from this uh, this book and this article and her last book that Naomi is in an understandable place. I. Forgive me, Naomi, if I'm wrong about this, but anyway, which is that thinking if you just say it right, people will like you. Hmm. And actually, that's not true, but I'm glad that <laughs> younger women or people with energy think that, you know, because it keeps us, you know, feisty and trying and trying new solutions. But it isn't a public relations movement, it is a revolution. And, wow. you know, we're, not everybody is going to like what we say. Wow. Well, you know, you really are quite a paradox of this issue of saying, right? Um, you addressed, uh, I think you're the first woman who ever addressed the Harvard Law School, is that right? And you said some things that pleased people and some things, one man jumped up enraged at you and publicly and... You've done all this homework. No, yes. no, but, but, oh, but all, all to say, all to say, <laughs> and the, uh, a famous uh, Smith College commencement that led to uh, this remarkable letter from someone who accused you of all kinds of things, all to say that this great way with words of saying not, it's not the right thing to say to this Pope about his skirts by any stretch of the imagination, but from a person who supposedly, uh, not, I don't suppose it is, is to question you, I don't mean to question you, but that you had a great fear of speaking. So how do you put together a fear with speaking with uh, a... Uh, what do we, how do we call it, a, uh, a love affair with speaking out? Um, well, I'll tell you, end up as a person who is extremely familiar with butterflies in the stomach, teeth uh, that acquire little angora sweaters because you've lost all your saliva and you can't get here. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, um, I've never gotten over uh, feeling nervous, more or less, depending on the on the situation. But it's true. I didn't ever speak in public until I was in my, I think, middle 30s, something like that. I was too afraid to. Um, but if you come upon something in life that is so important to you that you'll even get up and make a damn fool of yourself and, you know, face the butterflies and all of that, um, then you do it. You do it. And And I've... It, in the beginning, I still, for years, I still had no faith in it. You know, I still felt that it was much more important to write. I mean, that was serious, you know, writing things on paper. Um, speaking was just, uh, you know, second class somehow. But I've learned that that is not true. It's absolutely not true, because no matter what it is that you read, you're by yourself when you read it. And there's something that happens hmm. when we get together in a room and we have this collective wisdom of everybody and people see, oh, there's somebody from my laundromat. I never thought that person would come or be interested and there's somebody from my office, isn't that amazing, or my English class or something. And people get, you know, get up and say all these. It just, it just we, we need it desperately, I think, desperately, because we're so atomized by the media now, sitting by our television set, sitting, you know, by the, you know, reading our newspaper or whatever. And women especially need it, wherever we are, because women are the one group that doesn't have um, a country, will never have a country, which I've always thought was terrific. It makes us anti-nationalistic and subversive. Hmm. But... <laughs> Can you be sure we'll never have a country? (laughs) 
I don't think, well, the Amazons made it for a while, according to myth, but um, they had to, in order to procreate, they had to raid uh, Brazilian tribes and uh, <laughs> return the male tribe. No, no, I, I don't think. Won't happen. Anyway. I'm not into nationalism myself, anyway. Um, and, and we, you know, we don't have neighborhoods and bars and stuff, so we, we do need, women especially need to make these groups or gatherings where we can actually talk to each other and find out we're not crazy after all. Do you think you've had it all? Do I think I've had, not by the standards of, of having it all because um, that refers to this ridiculous idea that you can do two full-time jobs, you know, that you can, you know, take care of a house, have kids, cook gourmet meals, work outside, you know, which is the enemy of the women's movement, not a thing created by the women's movement, the superwoman. So no, not, not by that standards. I haven't married legally. I haven't had children biologically. So um, no. Mm -mm. Are you aware that people think you have it all? Um. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I don't know. I, I, that's, that's a good question. What does all mean in that case? Well, I guess uh, it means, um, I was thinking about that. And in the lists of having it all, like um, sort of in the reviews of the biography, it's actually listing men. Oh, yes. No, they're Political very, men and famous rich yeah, they're men. Very, yeah, they're very into listing your old lovers, you know. But they don't list your women friends. Isn't that weird? It's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. Um, well, what the hell, you know. I always think about Emma Goldman. Emma Goldman had one amazing sex life, you know. So <laughs> I figure, why not? Why not? It is a little painful sometimes, though, to see this emphasis. When you, uh, you know, the famous, uh, when you turned 40, you said, this is what 40 looks like. And in um, doing 60, you point out that there were two parts to that answer. I think somebody said to you, um, you don't look like you're 40. And you said, this is what 40 looks like. And then you said, we've been lying so long, who would know? And you point out that they cut that out mm -hmm. of it. What's the price of our, our lying as women? Well, I lied for a couple of years myself, that, you know, before I could be, that's why I became publicly 40, you know. And, <laughs> um, and I sort of got into it because, I don't know, it was certainly my own doing, but my sister has six kids and she had told all six kids that we were each two years younger than we were. It's a long story, but anyway. <laughs> so so I, I, had, I had lied for a while and I felt awful. I mean, just this one thing made me feel like such a jerk, you know, that somebody was going to find out that my passwords of it, it was awful. So I wouldn't want to pay that price again. Now, I, I realize that some women have to pay that price because they're in jobs, you know, where they would be let go if people knew, whatever. But I think we should make every effort not to have to. And then the... The other price, of course, is, is that um, people, all of us, don't know what ages really look like. Hmm. You know, we really think, I mean, it's great. I was watching just before I came, Julie Andrews on television because she's about to open, you know, in Victor Victoria. She's 60 years old, and she says she's 60 years old. She looks fan-fucking-tastic, and she sings... <laughs> <laughs> right. So, you know, we would have been denied knowing that uh, a few years ago. It's, it's, like, it's like any kind of coming out. You know, it's like coming out as a lesbian or coming out as a gay man or coming out as a person of color who doesn't look like they're a person of color. I don't know what, you know. But it's you're, you're, you not only reward yourself with kind of relaxing and saying I'm okay as I am, but you end up rewarding everybody around you. Hmm. Is there anything to be gained from lying? Uh, to be gained from lying, I think, is mostly external reward, you know, like jobs and, you know, the lover who thinks you're his age and you're really not, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. But I, I, but I notice in me, though, that because I used to lie about my age just totally, totally, 
when, but I was making myself older because I've been this big since I was about nine. You know, I, um, <laughs> I was, and I was working as a dancer and in makeup, you know, you can look older. So, so from a, I was making myself three, four, five, six, eight years older in order to get jobs. That didn't hurt so much because I was putting something over on them in a way that I wasn't giving in to a, to a um, negative stereotype. So mm. there is lying and lying, I guess. Mm. You can tell by how it makes you feel. Right. Well, I mean, you, you pretended to be a Playboy bunny, right? Yes, yeah. I didn't mind lying to do that either. <laughs> right. You know, I'm going to ask you um, one more uh, question, and then we'll, let's, let's hear what the audience wants to know. Um, given the times we're in, I thought that, you know, tonight I'd ask you some things that I thought were, were t tough, you know, which, which I tried to do. And um, another thing I came upon that I wanted to talk with you about is uh, some of the things you learned when you were in India. Two stick out in my mind the most. Uh, your team leader said, if you want people to listen to you, listen to them. If you want people to see you, you have to sit down with them eye to eye. And that seems to me to make a lot of sense. And certainly it seems that to some extent you've really been victorious at doing that in your life and in your career. Then I started to think in a way that advice works best if you're talking about leadership. What happens for the person who is not in leadership, who would like to talk to President Clinton, uh, but wouldn't be able to hear Mr. Clinton because Mr. Clinton is not going to talk to him, or uh, would like a person who would like to see the halls of power in order to be seen in the halls of power, but would never be admitted. H how do we work with that? Well, first of all, y you kind of have to not assume that the negative is true, mm -hmm. because then you're just defeated before you start. Mm -hmm. So no matter how unlikely it is that President Clinton is going to listen to this hypothetical guy, did uh, I say a man? I don't know. Yeah, you said him, but it doesn't matter, or her, whoever. Uh, I, think, I was thinking about the march, I guess, in a, to some that, extent, but a disenfranchised person. You, um, you can strategize on how you might force this person in power to listen to you. For instance, uh, I remember that Ralph Nader's mom, who is just as terrific as you might imagine Ralph Nader's mom to be, <laughs> Uh, was was um, living in a Connecticut town where there had been a flood. And so the local congressperson had come to say, I'm sorry, and pat people on the head. And she was completely unknown, and so was Ralph Nader at that point. But anyway, so he was shaking hands, and she shook his hand, and she wouldn't let go. And she said, <laughs> she said we need a dam. <laughs> and he said... He said, oh, well, thank you very much, you know, I'm so, and, 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 and he started, tried to go, and she kept holding on to his hand. She said, you don't understand, we need a dam. <laughs> so, you know, it's, you can, you can try to, th to think of ways, you know, to, to get to this person, however unlikely it may be. But, again, I would say, there's not really an individual solution uh -huh. to most anything. There's a group solution. So what you need to do is to get together with other folks who have the same message and then try to figure out a strategic way of, of, you know, of, of getting through. And what organizers do, actually, I mean, what I do, what lots of organizers and movements do, really, is to try to figure out some weird, imaginative, crazy way to get attention. I mean, we used to go with the farm workers. Um, we used to go to supermarkets, and we were boycotting grapes and lettuce and all this stuff, right? So, so we used to fill. We used to get twenty people, fill our carts with everything you can possibly imagine, go to the cashier, and then say, uh, "Are these union grapes?" No. Oh, I'm so sorry. I can't. You know, we'd leave all of our carts, twenty carts, completely. <laughs> 
we drove people up the wall, you know, and, and no, nobody knew who we were, but they sort of got the message about the grapes and eventually right. the grape shipments to the East Coast stopped, not just because of that, but because of many other things. So it's the fun of it, the mm -hmm. excitement of mm -hmm. it is, is to try to, it's, it's um, some people call it social jujitsu, you know, to try to figure out how to use the strength of the system against the system. Mm -hmm. And, and to, to try to get attention. But I would say it must be done with empathy. You know, you have to, if you're not going to polarize people, you have to try to put yourself in the other person's shoes. Which, even those in power. Even those in power. Can you give us an example of how, um, how you've done that? Well, I was thinking of, of, of uh, Ralph Nader's mom at the time uh, because, you know, she didn't do anything damaging or, right. or harmful uh, when, when she did that. Um, well, by the time we get through the... I'll the think of some more examples. Will. Yes, because you're right. Only examples mean anything. Generalities don't mean anything. <laughs> no, but you gave us two great examples. So should we, should we take some questions? Okay. And some answers? And some answers. And some organizing announcements? We, oh, good. We're getting some lights up, which is great. There's not mics, so please speak loudly, and I'll repeat your questions if we, if we need to. Um, well, I think we should both address this. I'll okay. go first, and then right. Please repeat the question. Uh, the, this woman um, over here wanted to know what we thought about the Million Man March, what it says. It, it seemed to me watching it that there were kind of two marches. You know, one was the march of the guys and their sons and so on who were interviewed on television and who um, were taking responsibility for their kids and bonding and drawing attention to the injustice and so on. And then there was the other march of Farrakhan who went on for two and a half hours, uh, you know, saying all kinds of things that seemed to me to be more appropriate to the Promise Keepers, Keepers march, you know, the, these, the, the white conservative groups called the Promise Keepers, if you encountered them, who have these huge, see, that's the racism of the media, I think, because they treat, well, anyway, there are these huge right-wing gatherings in football stadiums and so on called the Promise Keepers, and they also, like Farrakhan, are harking back to, um, back, I don't know if it ever existed, but anyway, some patriarchal, hierarchical, you know, women in their place, uh, completely racially separated time. So ironically, I think Farrakhan belonged more with with them, you know, too bad we couldn't put all the patriarchs together in one thing, you know. <laughs> but I, th there was a, a group of African American women, uh, Angela Davis and Marcia Gillespie, and lots of folks who made a statement, a very good statement about the Million Man March, which basically said, uh, you know, I'm I'm alighting it, but anyway, responsibility for kids, great. Responsibility for women, I don't think so, you know, because. Uh, we should be in this together and called attention to the exclusivity of, of asking women to stay home and so on. It was a good statement. Hmm. Um, I haven't thought through what I think about the fact that women weren't invited to the march um, at all, so I don't know if I can offer anything to that. I, I will say that uh, what I experienced was something which was um, a rather sober event. I uh, got there early, like about one o'clock in the morning, and decided to stay in a hotel downtown in Washington and, and saw all these guys out in the street and, and young women. And I thought, oh, well, this is just going to be a great big party. But um, it wasn't at all. And I talked to a young man afterwards, uh, when I was on the road this week, who said that for him, the most remarkable moment was a moment when Farrakhan asked everyone to take out a dollar. And so you look out and there's just like this sea of, of dollars. And he said he felt so safe under the dollars. And I thought that was a really interesting idea, that he felt safe under the dollars 
and that he felt safe that nobody was going to take any dollars. I just, just an image that I was working through. Yes. Well, there's, there's plenty of hope, and it gives me hope just to hear you, but um, I, uh, I would comment on his hair. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it's, it's clear that what feminism is about is, and what every social justice movement is about, is, is um, giving individual, giving us the power to decide. It sort of matters less what we decide than that we have the power to decide. So the idea that there's a contradiction, um, I, you know, never made a lot of sense to me, really, and, and unless you're wearing high heels when you may have to run for the bus or something like that, I mean, then you're impeding yourself, but, but we should be able to do whatever we fucking well please and wear what we want and do what we want. That's the whole idea. So, you know, there is no, I, I never felt uh, really the, that kind of, of contradiction. But it is, it is helpful, maybe this is reverse empathy that we were looking for here. It is, it is helpful just to do to them what they're doing for you, to, to you. I remember sitting on a, a television show once and the, this guy was saying, well, how can you possibly be a feminist? I had on jeans, I think, he said, I don't know what I had on, but pants. He said, you're, you know, look at these tight clothes you're wearing. And I said to him, stand up. And he stood up. And I said, well, you know, your pants are tighter than mine. And I would <laughs> think that it was... <laughs> I mean, reversal is a great, is a great device. But um, also don't worry about too much about the people who, who disagree. I say this only, I don't mean it quite that way, but here's what I mean. I don't know about you, but I find in myself the tendency when I go into a room, there could be a hundred people over here who want to move forward and are full of energy and want to work on something. Then there are 10 people over here who are saying, oh, that's ridiculous, don't do it. So I will go over and try to convince the 10. So I have, I'm trying to remind myself not to try to convince the 10, but to work with the hundred who already want to move forward. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, yes. What can be done to bridge the gap between African Americans and Jews? And do women have a role to play in that? I think a very great deal can be done, some of which is being done, not enough of which is being done. And yes, I do think women have a special role because we are, we share a certain number of experiences and a certain outsiderness within our, our own groups. So I'm, I'm happy to see that there are uh, some groups of women African-American women and Jewish women who meet together regularly and talk to each other and create this, this kind of bridge. Uh, you don't see as much of it as you should, I think, because when the media asks those groups for their opinions, they go to the male leaders. For instance, if you went to Jewish women's groups, you would get a very different set of opinions about affirmative action than you do from going to the male leadership. But that 
usually is not done. And similarly, you know, uh, you know, you don't see many ex outside of Congress and elected leaders. You know, you don't see too many African American women either. So we need to highlight our spokespeople and get them out there. And we need to consciously go and talk to each other. Um, the the there was there was uh, two groups here trying to get together in New York. Perhaps I shouldn't say their names because I don't I haven't asked their permission. But anyway, a group of African American women and Jewish women trying to get together and having a tough time. So they asked a feminist uh, kind of conflict resolution expert, you know, what they should do, and she said to them a very smart thing. She said, "Do your presidents know each other?" And they said, "No." They said, "Well," she said, "just have lunch once a month for." you know, five or six months, and with no agenda, just get to know each other, and your groups will be able to work together. And they were. The presidents. Right. Just the president. Yeah, just because, you know, you have to know each other first. You have to be able to talk to each other first. But I do think that we, we, we have a special role, just as we did in bridging some of the gaps in the Middle East, just as the Irish peace women did. You know, they're, they're, we can make these kind of bridges more easily. Great. Let's, uh, I can't see very well all the way to the back, but there's a gentleman, yes. No, it's a lady. The question is, were either one of us in China at the Beijing conference, and what's the implication for moving forward? I was not. Were you there? I was not. No. But I, I mean, I almost went, so, you know, and I've been listening. So did I. Almost. <laughs> um, I, uh, I didn't go in a rare burst of maturity because I suddenly dawned on me that I should do what I could uniquely do, and there were lots of other people there, and, you know, I could run. Uh, but I, I do think that... We have seen now over the long haul from 75 to now the gradual painful birth of an international women's movement with pretty good, not good enough, but pretty good connections with each other over the heads and under the noses of governments. Um, so that the groups that were delighted to be invited in for tea, you know, in 75 are now inside May, assessing every UN statement, every word for its impact on the female half of the world, and connecting with each other in order to press the UN process. Um, now, what impact does this have on our daily lives? Well, it, it establishes a sort of a new ground floor for rights. I mean, to talk about women's rights as human rights is new and very important, you can see how upset the Pope was because the Pope wants to be in favor of human rights and is very alarmed at the idea that they might include women's rights. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's useful in a change of the atmosphere uh, and social policy kind of way. And sometimes it's useful in an individual way and we should be aware of w what these statements are in case we can use them as individually or with our groups. For instance, there was in one Central American country, this is reported in the, in the New York Times, a woman who had cancer and was told to have a complete hysterectomy. Uh, her husband forbade her to have it, and as was the case there and in many other countries and used to be the case here, you, she couldn't have any, this hysterectomy or any interference with her childbearing without her husband's written permission. Her husband wouldn't give her permission because he said she hadn't borne all the children that he had in mind yet. So her lawyer took to the court the reproductive rights statements uh, that came out of Cairo, and she won. So it's, I'm not saying that that's the usual event, but still we should be aware of these uh, statements. And also, this pattern of organizing to influence the UN is very interesting. I think it's a paradigm for other interest groups, for environmental groups and many other interest groups in hooking into the UN process and influencing the UN. Mm -hmm. see. Yes. Uh, <laughs> the, you want to repeat it? Yeah. yeah. 
Could, could, could I talk about the effect the Republican agenda on welfare is going to have on the women of this country? Um, you know, sometimes I think single mothers have now replaced communists as the <laughs> unifying, you know, enemy, you know, of, 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 the, of the right wing. It's so alarming what is happening. And to the extent that, as is often said, every woman in America with little children is one man away from welfare, you know, because it's very tough for women to earn enough to support those kids. It's, it's a jeopardy for, for all of us. Um, we're going to, you know, given the situation now, I mean, we've, we've all, you know, we've tried all kinds of things, and I'm, you know, ads and pressures and lobbying and so on, and we're now going to have to fight it through state by state. But it is an incredible danger. But I think, I think we also have to take some of the rap ourselves, and here's why. We have not brought together the kind of coalition that we need to be successful in keeping this change from happening. Um, we need to value the work that is done in the home and raising children. We, it needs to have an attributed economic value. And the linkage then is possible between women on welfare and not, women not on welfare because the woman who now has two jobs, one inside the home and one outside, has two jobs because one is invisible. And the, the, the woman who is the homemaker uh, full-time needs to have this attributed value so she is perceived as the business partner, so to speak, of her hmm. husband, so that she, so, you know, it's, and that's the, the trouble of, for the women on welfare is that work in the home and raising children is not perceived as valuable. So they have got away with being completely duplicitous, completely duplicitous. I mean, we, we went and I, I tried, well, we were all trying to get them to live on the welfare food budget for a week. Uh, people in Congress to educate them, you know, but hmm. I, but I was also s saying to them, you know, I think we should cut the salaries of people in Congress because as it is, you all can support a completely non-working spouse, you know, who just stays at home and does nothing. You know, they, they, they attribute all the social ills of the world to women working outside the home and not being at home with their kids. And then these bastards have the nerve to say, to force women on welfare out of the homes and away from their kids. I mean, it is outrageous. It is really outrageous. But we apparently have not done our work. We have to do that more. And we have to deliver the vote. Right? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Who might I vote for in the next presidential election? Um, well, I sent a note to Colin Powell, thanking him for supporting affirmative action and supporting reproductive rights and, <laughs> and supporting gun control and so on. Um, I've been following him around the book circuit. He seems, seems like a very nice guy, but I do not think that he's actually going to be a, a presidential candidate. And, and if he runs on the Republican platform, it would be a problem anyway. So um, I, I, have, I have no qualms at all about saying that I am happy to reelect Clinton and her husband. Uh. <laughs> but I, but let, me, let me just tell you why, because I think that we get sucked into, um, you know, feeling that politicians are all alike and, you know, our vote doesn't matter and all this. So I'll give you an example. I, I'm wearing these two bracelets, which maybe you've seen. They're sort of like um, MIA bracelets, but this one says Rosie Jimenez and her birth and death date. She was the first woman who died because of an illegal abortion because there was no Medicaid funding. And this one is for Becky Bell, who was the first woman who died of an illegal abortion because there was parental consent, right? Now, before the last presidential election, I was wearing a third bracelet that said, one woman dies every three minutes internationally because of our Mexico City policy, which said, as you remember, that you can't, couldn't even talk about abortion if you got any US foreign aid. 
When Clinton was elected, I could take off that third bracelet. Hmm. That meant everything to me. Mm -hmm. I was happy to campaign and vote and give money. It was worth it just for that one thing. And there have been other <laughs> things that would have made it worth it as well. So, Yes, up in the top there. Well, uh, thank you. Did you all hear that? <laughs> if if uh, Nicole Brown Simpson cannot get any retribution, how can the average woman on the street? That's a crude yep. summing up of what she said. Yeah, and she was also saying that the uh, that she, she came to the rally about yes. the Pope, right? Um, and that it didn't get much press. Now we treat the Pope like Queen Elizabeth, you know, as if he had no politics, you know. But but it was okay. We had a great time. We had big signs that said. You know, with a picture of the Pope saying, why can't a woman get this job? You know, we had... <laughs> Olympia the caucus. You know. um, but it wasn't reported, it's true, very much. The, uh, what, what can, how can the ordinary woman get justice? Well, you know, there, <laughs> we have to look to our own... Where, the most, where we have the most responsibility or we have the most power is where we should start. So we need to start with uh, intervening in situations we see, offering help, offering apartments, uh, offering to take in women and their kids if we know that they're in danger, helping women to go and get restraining orders. I know that they may not be that physically helpful, but they're important as you can see in this case because only if it has a police record does it get you know, uh, introduced into court and counted. We can, you know, do all these things that we personally can do, and we can educate each other with this case. For instance, uh, O.J. Simpson, you might say, served a year because he was in jail for a year. Now, the average, of course, this was a double murder, so this doesn't, but anyway, the, the, the average case of a man who kills his girlfriend or his wife uh, is one in which the man serves, he may be sentenced to more, but he serves three years. The average case in which a uh, woman kills her husband or boyfriend, even in clear self-defense, she serves 11 years. There was a, a, a case in Maryland of a man who shot his sleeping wife in the head. Uh, she didn't die. He got three months. The bullet is still lodged in her head. She couldn't get uh, police protection. She enlisted the help of a friend to kill him, and she is now in jail without parole. The battery of this kind is the single greatest cause of injury for all women, and the, there, there don't seem to be uh, racial or ethnic differentials, really. I mean, it's the single, there may be some, but it's the single greatest cause for all women. So if we if we tell each other that, if we speak out about it, if we offer protection in the cases in, in which we know, if we get out because we learn from this and other cases that it does escalate, you know, that then we'll feel empowered. We feel most disempowered when we're saying, what can they do? Did, you, did your relationship with Denise Brown help politicize her? No, she was, I, I had nothing to do with that. She was already, I met Denise Brown, the sister of Nicole, 
uh, some months after the murder. She was already very active going around to battered women's shelters. Mm -hmm. um, way in the back there, in the middle, yes. Did you hear it? Okay. Did everybody else hear this? Do you want to read it? Um, with all the problem, problems going on in America, how can we address ourselves to the problems of the women in the third world, specifically the problem of genital mutilation? And then, I, did you hear the other part? And in the Muslim world. And the Muslim world. Yeah. Okay. I, I think we can't not. You know, because it makes us stronger and it makes them stronger. But we have to do it in a way that says, that asks those women what they want us to do. You know, uh, n not, not telling other people what to do. Um, now, when it comes to the, the issue of female genital mutilation, we can also do something in this country, too, because it is happening in... First of all, it happened in uh, New York and in Brooklyn, and in, uh, you, I mean, in Brooklyn it was a group of nuns who were, who, who were somehow convinced that if a woman's clitoris was surgically excised, she would no longer be a prostitute. Catholic uh, nuns? Yes, <laughs> the best kind. <laughs> and uh, 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 also I talked to a, a woman who had been genitally mutilated by a Park Avenue physician in the 1950s because she was masturbating as a child and he said this was a proper treatment. So let's not think, you know, that it is completely somewhere else or that the amount of cosmetic surgery and breast implants and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's related. It's related. It's not, you know, those people over there and us over here. It's related. Um, but there are also uh, activists in this country. Mimi Ramsey, for instance, is a very brave woman from Ethiopia who is uh, in Washington and California campaigning with African families, going up to African families who have little girls in the street and saying, you know, what do you think about this issue? Are you planning, you know, and trying to do health education and, you know, to keep it from happening within this country. We can make sure that our foreign aid dollars are not used in this way. We can try to phrase it as a human rights uh, violation. We, we can, you know, look at the connections between our cultures. For instance, women in this country are learning a terrific amount about economic development or economic empowerment projects from women in third world countries who are much more sophisticated about it. So now there are a lot of uh, cooperatively owned businesses in this country um, that you know, are, are modeled consciously and otherwise after third world development projects. So yes, we, we need to ignore national boundaries whenever possible. Hmm. Um, let's see, how about over there? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Mm. Well, uh, you, you, you'll be, I hope, encouraged to know that according to the polls, there are more young feminists than there ever were before. Uh, <laughs> And it happens that after this program, the third wave, a young feminist organization is <laughs> having a great reception over here. So just come and join us and, you know, you'll see a lot more. But it's, it's also true that women's pattern of activism is different from men's. I don't mean everybody, but just sort of the cultural patterns are different. Men tend to be rebellious when they're young and get more conservative as they get older except for all the men in this audience who must be an exception to everything that I said. <laughs> and, and, and women tend to be conservative when we're young and get more rebellious as we grow older. So if young women have a problem, it's mostly that we don't know yet there's a problem when we're young. You know, we haven't yet experienced being in the labor force, being married, having kids, all of these. So just, just wait. If there aren't an, enough, you know, just wait. 
because we do get more radical with age. But in the, but I don't really mean wait because we should never wait. So talk to your age peers and say, uh, you know, what your experience has been and how feminism as a whole worldview has helped you. And if you speak out about it, you'll, you'll get, uh, you'll attract support. Great. Let's just take a couple more questions. Um, in the back there. Uh, the, the, this woman is saying that she saw a film about Dr. Spock and there was a snippet of me denouncing him, just very quick, and how do, how do I feel about him now, especially his... If the film didn't explain that, I'm really disappointed in the film because the, I wasn't exactly denouncing him, but he came to speak at the 1971 founding conference of the National Women's Political Caucus. Now, we were in the middle of desperate, you know, trying to make these incredibly diverse groups in you know, make a statement, a founding statement that everybody would be happy with. I mean, we were going crazy. We'd been up for three nights. And somebody had invited a couple of guys to come speak, one of whom was Dr. Spock, which was not his fault and was somebody's poor judgment because everybody was very impatient with the idea that we should listen, you know. And besides, besides that, um, he, his, his early works, as you know, really traced everything, gave all the work and all the responsibility to the mother. <laughs> So women were hissing and booing him. And I, ever trying to be the bridge, you know, <laughs> stood up and tried to, he was shocked. He didn't understand why. It was his first experience. So I stood up and tried to explain to him. I said, but you, you must understand that it's because you said X and Y. And that only made it worse, <laughs> I guess. But uh, he, he changed to, to his everlasting credit because we all start out wherever we start out. It's the changing hmm. that's the gift. He changed and, and rewrote even his earlier books, I think, he changed. Not to mention becoming a great peace activist. Next, we'll take just about one last question, I think. How, how do you feel, Gloria, about it? Okay. One, two, what do you want? It's up to you. <laughs> How about any organizing announcements? Do you have any announcements for each other? This is a great opportunity. <laughs> yes, there's something there. Um, a little bit about Katie Chang, the political conference on women. I wanted to announce that this Wednesday night at the NYU Law School Auditorium at 7 o'clock, NYU Law School Auditorium, I think that's just for the Women's Black Action. Huh. <laughs> Thank you. Do you, you right. want one last question? Yeah. Okay, we're going to take one last question. So you, you, right. there's a guy, okay, gentleman. Somebody said that. I'm responding to the audience. Oh, they don't want me to respond. <laughs> Hissing. Sorry. Yes, this gentleman I was suggesting that there be a women's party and that Gloria could be president, which, <laughs> which as early as 1971, Newsweek felt that too, that you should run for office. Hmm? Yeah. They did. Um, yes, we see citing that Ross Perot got 80,000 signatures or whatever mm -hmm. was necessary to put uh, a line on the ballot. Um, and why don't, why don't women do this? Well, you, you know, I think that 
we have done it to some extent. I mean, for instance, Shirley Chisholm was a very important candidate uh, who, for whom I ran as a delegate and who kind of helped to take the white male only sign off the White House, you know. Uh, but that was a symbolic educational candidacy. I think in practical terms right now, there is a conviction that it would only help Dole or whoever the Republican candidate might be get elected and, and nobody wants to do that. Um, as, as for being president, it's true that, that, you know, I used to say, oh, you know, no, no. and then Reagan and Bush came along and removed all sense of humility I might ever want. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think we perhaps look too much at the top, you know, because uh, real change comes from the bottom up. You build it like a house, you know. And what we need up there is somebody who just won't say no. And I think uh, Clinton is actually better than we deserve, considering that how little we participate. We're the mm. least participatory democracy mm. in the world. So... I would rather devote myself, and that's what I'm going to do, you know, mm. until, until the election, to going around and trying to be helpful in terms of, of registering voters and getting people out to vote and um, saying, you know, all self-respecting folks have to, I hope everybody here is registered. You know, we should have had registration forms here. Well, they'll <laughs> register now. <laughs> and uh, although I think that... that in some ways, I too have been guilty of perhaps giving the impression that too much would happen as a result of the vote. So now I just say, the politicians won't even come and lie to you if you're not registered. I mean, you know, you, <laughs> you won't count at all. <laughs> but um, I think we've got to take our electoral system back. Okay. It's ours. Thank you. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.